Okay, so we have we have a great uh, uh, plenary session ahead. I think there's going to be some exciting uh, connections between uh, these two talks. And so, um, first up, uh, John List from University of Chicago. Uh, take it away, John. Um, thank you so much, Dean and, and uh, committee. Thanks so much for putting together such a wonderful program. I, I was leafing through it last night, and it it, it really does look wonderful. So, I want to say congratulations. And, um, and thanks for having me. Let me share my, my screen here. Okay, so what I wanna talk about with, uh, with my next 15 minutes, my, my 15 minutes of fame is, uh, is something that I, I call the voltage effect. And what I, the way I want you to think about the voltage effect is that this is as near as a law as we can get in economics, okay? And I'll explain what the voltage effect is um, today in the next 15 minutes. Now, really what, what this research program is about is trying to answer the question, why do so many ideas fail to deliver on their promise when scaled? My own research, I, I've written a fair amount in this area in the last several years, and I, I call it the science of using science. So after we develop interventions or programs that work, what is the science of scaling those insights to, from the Petri dish to the, the larger setting? Now, my own scaling road sort of happened now, nearly 15 years ago, there's a school district called Chicago Heights, which is a, a difficult school district in terms of, um, you know, roughly a thousand kids start high school every year and only about 480 of them receive high school diplomas after four or five years. It's a community that the world is, is sort of left behind and it's um, a community with a lot of broken dreams and, and families. And, and they asked me to come in and, and help them out. So I started a, a pre-K with Roland Fryer and Steve Levitt back in 2010. And that pre-K was called the Chicago Heights Early Childhood Center. The pre-K was set up to help three, four and five-year-olds. And, and we worked very hard to develop the best curriculum we could using field experiments. And with the trial and error, after four years, we created what we believe to be a great curriculum to teach three, four, and five-year-olds, both COG skills and executive function skills. So at this point, this is now 2014, I am exuberant about this new program that we've just innovated, and I want the whole world to have check, okay? Now comes the slap in the face. So I go to experts and policymakers, and what they tell me is, quote, Professor List, your program had an impressive benefit profile, but don't expect it to happen at scale. I ask why. And they said, well, there's no silver bullet in your program. And I'm thinking, well, wait a second. What is this silver bullet thing that you're talking about? And where do I find it? How do, how do I get it in my program? Then they go on to say, all of the experts tell us their interventions will work, but treatment results aren't close to what they promise. So then I go on to ask them, well, why is that the case? Why is it the case that there's a great result in the small, but when you scale it, the result is minuscule compared to what you expected? And then they go on to say, well, there's this new area called implementation science. And what they tell us is that it's because of fidelity, but we just don't know. So at this point, 
I'm thinking, wow, my entire career, I started doing field experiments in the early 90s. And my entire career was built around using the world as my lab, testing theory, and then exploring what are the underlying mechanisms that are involved in the mediation paths, what's the causal moderation, and exactly what's the causal relationship that I'm learning about in the real world, working with businesses, working with governments, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And now I'm faced with this new type of question that, look, you may have found a great curriculum or you have a great innovation, but there's no way you're gonna have the same benefit cost profile that you do when you scale it. Now, at this point then I said, well, I'm gonna look into this some more. And indeed, uh, scoured the literature, downloaded mounds and mounds of data, did all the meta-analyses that you can think about. And yes, indeed, the one part that they were right about is what I call the voltage effect. And this poster behind me, of course, is, is a new book that I've written titled The Voltage Effect on this line of research. So some shameful advertisement. The voltage effect is effectively turning a mountain into a molehill. You have a great result initially. And then when you scale it up, it ends up being only a fraction of what you thought would happen. Okay, that's the voltage effect. And when you look at the data, I know we're not as cool as hard scientists. We don't have great quantitative laws, but in economics, we have these qualitative laws, law of demand, law of supply, law of comparative advantage. The voltage effect law is pretty close to those nearly every time it happens. And the nature of how much it happens, of course, depends on the particulars. So where I start, any good economist will then start by writing down models. So we wrote down a ton of theory and we paired it with all of those data. And that's what ends up is this understanding about the voltage effect or about the science of using science that I'm, I'm gonna talk about today. Now, my thesis is that even though the policymakers and implementation scientists were correct in saying there's a stylized fact out there that there's a voltage drop, where they were wrong is this is not a silver bullet problem. This is far from a silver bullet problem. The problem, problem is more like a weakest link problem. And the way I want you to think about it is uh, one of my favorite novels is Anna Karenina. And uh, Tolstoy started Anna Karenina by saying something like, um, happy families are all alike. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. I want you to think about scaling that way too. Um, scalable ideas are all alike. Each unscalable idea is unscalable in its own way, but it will revolve around what I call five vital signs. So it's really like a weakest link problem. If these five vital signs are not in place, then you for sure will not scale with the same voltage that you are finding in the Petri dish. So in essence, these five vital signs provide some insights into the breadth and depth of your idea or policy when you scale it. Okay, so you might now wonder, well, what are these, what are these five vital signs? And these five vital signs are essentially coming from a combination of the theory and the empirical work we've done. And they look as follows. So the first vital sign is what I call inference. And, and this is where it, um, it's, we sort of have a link with Isaiah's work because in, in the model that we put together, it's really a knowledge creation market where we have policymakers, researchers, and citizens and they all have their own objective functions and they play a game, uh, a game theoretic model. And underlying the voltage effect are these reasons for why the actors are doing what they're doing. And, and one of the, 
objectives of government, of course, is to advance policies that work, that, that help the populace. Now, when they do that, of course, they choose from a, uh, a suite of policies that researchers put forward, and there's an element of a winner's curse there. The, the more researchers that are trying to innovate, the worse the winner's curse problem will be, and the worse the inference problem becomes for the policymaker. And it's, it's sort of a conundrum there because most of the time we think, well, the more people who are working on a problem simultaneously, we will get to the truth. That's true in the long run, but in the short run, when you're when you're picking policies, uh, you tend to choose the, the the biggest treatment effect size, so to speak, and that'll be the one that that has the largest random error draw in in its in in, in the research itself. So so that's a, a little winner's curse element. But when you look at the suite of policies and ideas that have failed, a lot of them fail because there was never actionable evidence to begin with. There, there was a false positive. So the running example that I use in the, in the voltage effect around inference is um, the Nancy Reagan just say no policy that uh, the dare policy that, that she made famous in the mid eighties, which I, I was part of, I was in high school in the mid eighties and um, a federal official came in and, and taught us to just say no. And, and I looked at my teacher and I said, there's no way this will work. I don't do drugs, but I have a lot of friends who do. And there's no way that this will work. And my teacher said, well, they, they say there's evidence about it. There was actually evidence. There's pretty good evidence from Honolulu. But the, the problem was, is it could never be replicated. And it just turned out to be a statistical error. Um, in the book for the lay audience, I, I talk about this as the data are lying. Um, so, so that's point number one is that I, I think about this in a Bayesian way that we should have a post-study probability of 0.95 or higher before we advance any policy. Now, that's harder with check because with check, it's, it's very difficult. You need to replicate components. Now, I moonlight as the chief economist at Lyft. And before that, I was a chief economist at Uber. There, it's a lot easier. Um, there, within two or three days, I can determine whether I have a false positive or not. So, so that aspect of it, I think, ends up being, being extremely important in terms of making sure we don't have an inference problem. Now, the second bucket that we have here is called the properties of the situation. Now, now this is a big bucket in terms of this idea around, well, the situational features might be different at scale than they were in the Petri dish. So if you think about check, at check, I only had to hire 20 or 30 teachers. Now at, at scale, I might have to be in the same market and hire 20 to 30,000 teachers. So if an important component of my program is the quality of the instructor, now it becomes very important because it's very hard to scale that by keeping the same quality. So the properties of the situation is a very big bucket, but it includes a lot of features that will demand the researcher to enumerate what are the negotiables in my idea what are the non-negotiables in my idea? And can we scale the non-negotiables to make sure that they match what happened in the Petri dish at scale? The, the third bucket is properties of the population. And this is essentially, a lot of times we have convenience samples and, and we run a test to give the test or the theory its best shot. It's called an efficacy test. In medicine, they have uh, guardrails that say, well, after you do an efficacy test, you do phase one, phase two, and phase three. In the social sciences and in the business world, a lot of times we run it and then we forget to tell everyone that it was an efficacy test. And it worked for one group of people, but not others. So in the, in the Chicago Heights example, it could work for Czech families, but it might not work in London or in New York or in, uh, in Manchester, wherever. Okay, it, it's important to understand the properties of the population. Now, now, the fourth bucket is what I call spillovers in GE effects. 
And, and here, I, I sort of leveraged some old examples from Uber. In fact, John has a wonderful paper um, looking at market dynamics from a change in the rate card for Uber drivers. So what you find is that if you try to raise the pay for Uber drivers, what you have to do is you have to change what's called the rate card. On Uber and Lyft, drivers are paid per minute and per mile when they have somebody in their back seat. So if you run an experiment where you do, let's say 5% of drivers receive a higher rate card, what will happen is the drivers will have a labor supply elasticity of about 0.4, they'll work more and they'll make more money. But what happens when you make 95% of the drivers treated and have a higher rate card? Well, what will happen is they'll increase labor supply, the market will have to come to a new equilibrium. And as John's great paper shows, is that that new equilibrium entirely undoes the good stuff of the rate card increase. Why? Because now more drivers are driving around, but they're driving around with an empty car more often. So their hourly wage turns out to be the same as what it was before the rate card change. And it's entirely because of gender equilibrium. Now in check, we had these really interesting spillover effects which I saw that Susan will talk about tomorrow, Susan and co-authors will talk about tomorrow. And in the SUDVA violations that we had in check is that if you were a control kid and you lived around a lot of treatment kids, it was like you were in treatment yourself. So we had this brilliant SUDVA violation that ended up being a paper. It's called the social, uh, um, the social, that, that the social side of human capital formation. Because what we find is that checks spilled over both between parents in the program and between kids. So the spillover between kids was the executive function skill spillover. The spillover between parents occurred in the cognitive side where the parents in the control group ended up, they were more likely to sign their kids up for other uh, preschool if they were in our control group. And then that worked on the cognitive side for the child. So, so the fourth bin here is to understand what are the, the GE effects or what are the spillovers of your idea or policy. And then finally, the fifth one is the supply side, which the implementation scientists have completely ignored to date. But this is, of course, what we economists, um, this is our bread and butter. Um, what is the supply side of your program? And here, this is really about, uh, do we have economies or diseconomies of scale? So if you think about check, if I wanted to make sure that the benefit profile stayed the same, what I would have to do is I would have to make sure that the quality of the teacher stayed the same as I went from hiring 30 teachers to 30,000 teachers. Now, we know within a market that that's very difficult to do without going up the supply curve. There's just so much heterogeneity amongst teachers that to have the same quality level, I'm going to have to raise and raise and raise the wages. What will happen? Even though I don't have a voltage drop on the benefit side, I have an important one on the cost side, and that really fundamentally changes the benefit cost profile at scale. So it still leads to a voltage drop, but it's just happening through the supply side. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there. That was a quick whirlwind tour of the first uh, half of the voltage effect. Um, uh, organizers, uh, thanks again. And I will now go off, stop, share, because I'm done with my slideshow. Yeah, thank, thanks a lot, John. That was, that was great. And uh, we'll have some more discussion about this. So, so please everyone use the Q&A feature to start throwing some of your questions in there. One, one question um, I had is actually on that last point about the supply side. Um, here, it, it, you know, in this conference, we think a lot about digital technology. And I think if you were, say, delivering a educational intervention through uh, pre-recorded videos, maybe some of that scales up really well because you just still have that same, same teacher. And so I wonder if you think that, that just some, some technological change may help lessen some of that supply side being the binding, the binding constraint in all this? No, absolutely. So Dean, that's a wonderful question. In, in chapter three, it, it's titled 
Is it the chef or is it the ingredients? And the running example is Jamie Oliver and the, the wealth of restaurants that try to scale. So restaurants that invariably fail to scale, their secret sauce, so to speak, is the chef. Humans don't scale. That's the first thing to remember that one lesson you learn when you look at this area is that if you think you're gonna scale with humans, good luck. It's very, very difficult. Now, what does scale though is technology. So in the restaurant case, for example, if you have a great brick oven that will work in several other buildings, that will scale. If it's the ingredients, think about Domino's. Uh, the secret sauce behind Domino's, it's the ingredients, those scale. So in many cases, it's understanding what are the secret components or important components of what you're doing and making sure that those elements, both on the quality side and the cost side, have a chance to scale. One thing you're talking about is, is teachers and recordings. Yes, technology. the more we can innovate and scale with technology, the more we can make the voltage effect less of a law because it's a law because of the, the manner in which we've done innovation and have done ideas. We tend not to think about what is this going to take at scale, where as researchers, we need to backward induct and say, if I want my idea to scale big from the very beginning, I need to understand what constraints there will be in the system at scale and make sure that I'm innovating within those constraints. Because unless I can alleviate those constraints at scale, I'm going to have something that just won't change the world in a big way. Yeah, I think, I think that's great, the idea of pushing some of this earlier into the innovation process, too. So people are thinking about that already. Thanks. Well, obviously, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to some of these topics. I want to turn now to um, our next uh, plenary speaker, uh, MIT graduate, uh, former MIT faculty. But uh, Isaiah Andrews is now joining us from, from Harvard. Um, very interested to hear about some of this uh, winner's, winner's curse. Isaiah. Great. Uh, thanks very much to Dean and all the other organizers for including me. And uh, thanks so much for putting me together in the same session with John. Um, as you said, uh, Dean, earlier, and as John said, I think there are a lot of uh, similar sort of thematic similarities uh, to, that, we can, that we can touch on here. Um, so um, today, I'm very excited to talk about Inference on Winners, which is joint work with uh, Tor Kitagawa and Adam McCloskey. Um, actually, just a sec. Um, excellent. So in this project, uh, we're interested in inference on the best performing treatment in an experiment, right? Where the reason there's an interesting question to think about here, which relates very much to the inference part of what uh, John was just talking about, is that the data-driven choice of a target parameter, the data-driven choice of what we're trying to do inference on, leads to bias and under coverage for conventional estimators and confidence sets respectively. We're, of course, we're far from the first to notice this. For example, uh, this has recently been noted by Li and Chen, 2018, among many, many others. To illustrate sort of the precise bias we're interested in here, though, I'm going to start out by thinking about a stylized example. So for this example, let's imagine a researcher who runs a randomized trial and is interested in estimating average outcomes under two different treatments, say treatment theta 1, treatment theta 2. Let x theta 1, x theta 2 be the experimental average outcomes under these two treatments, where uh, we'll, motivated by the central limit theorem, think of these as being normally distributed, which means mu theta 1, mu theta 2. And for simplicity in the example, I'll say identity variance covariance matrix. Now, since we're running a randomized trial here, right, mu theta 1 and mu theta 2 are going to just be the population average outcomes under these two treatments. In this setting, we face a natural question of which of these two treatments to recommend. Right? And one natural thing to do, which does show up in practice, is to pick the recommendation which maximizes the observed outcome. Right? So to take uh, theta hat equal to the arg max of x theta. So I recommend the treatment that generated the better outcome in the experiment. Now, along with such a recommendation, we might also want an assessment for the effectiveness of the recommended treatment. Right, specifically estimates and confidence sets for mu theta hat. That is the true effectiveness of the sort of estimated best treatment. 
Note though that uh, theta hat equals theta one, that is I recommend treatment one only if x theta one is greater than or equal to x theta two. All right, so I recommend treatment one only if treatment one performed better in the experiment. This means though that the distribution of my estimated effectiveness for treatment one conditional on recommending that treatment is truncated below. Right, and specifically, uh, the probability that I uh, overestimate the effectiveness of treatment one conditional on recommending that treatment is going to be strictly greater than a half. But the problem is totally symmetric in theta one, theta two. So uh, the same is going to hold unconditionally as well. So the unconditional probability that I overestimate the effectiveness of the recommended treatment is going to be strictly greater than a half. Right, so what this is saying is that x theta half, right, the estimated effectiveness of my recommended treatment is upwards median bias as an estimate for the true effectiveness of that treatment, right? Perhaps not too surprisingly, the standard confidence set, right, which just takes the estimated effectiveness for my recommended treatment, adds and subtracts 1.96 standard errors, may also undercover. Now to see if this sort of winner's curse bias matters quantitatively, Let's extend the uh, toy example here by thinking about cases with two, but also 10 and 50 treatments, where for simplicity, I'm gonna to continue to assume identity variance covariance matrix across our estimates for the different treatments. I'm gonna suppose that the first treatment is weakly more effective than in the others. So mu theta one is greater than or equal to mu theta two, while all the remaining treatments are equally effective in the sense of generating the same average outcome. Right, so there are just two effectiveness parameters to keep track of here. Mu theta one, the effectiveness of the first treatment, and mu theta minus one, the effectiveness of all the remaining treatments. In this setting, we'll think about the performance of the usual estimator, right? Just the sort of average effectiveness of the recommended treatment in the experiment, and the conventional or more pejoratively naive confidence set, right? Which just takes the standard estimator, adds and tracks 1.96 standard errors. So to get started, here I'm showing you the unconditional median bias measured as the overestimation probability minus a half, right? So this is the probability that my experimental average outcome for the recommended treatment exceeds the true effectiveness of that treatment minus a half. Where on the horizontal axis, I'm varying the gap mu theta one minus mu theta minus one between the effectiveness of the first treatment and the effectiveness of all the other treatments. So the way to read this is that if the you know, if I'm considering a case with, say, two treatments, both of which are equally effective, I've got about a 75% chance of overestimating the effectiveness of my recommended treatment. As I make one treatment more effective than the other, right, as I move in this direction, that overestimation probability comes down and eventually settles down at a half, right? So I'm equally likely to over and underestimate, I'm median unbiased. If I increase the number of treatments to con consider to 10, right, the bias gets worse but behaves in a qualitatively similar way. Likewise, if I increase the number of treatments to 50, right? So one thing that we're seeing here is the, you know, the more things that I try, the worse this winner's curse bias is getting. And the bigger a gap I need between the best treatment and the other treatments to sort of make this bias go away. Now, in addition to thinking about bias, we can also think about coverage. So what's the probability that our usual point estimate plus minus 1.96 standard error confidence set covers the true effectiveness of the recommended treatment? Interestingly, in the case with just two treatments, there's actually not an under coverage problem. So if I'm just comparing two alternatives in the context of this stylized example, I don't end up under covering. If I increase the number of treatments to 10 though, Right, then when the treatments are equally effective, my nominal 95% confidence set ends up covering the true effectiveness of the recommended treatment only about 80% of the time. If I increase the number of treatments to 50, coverage probability drops to about 30%. So hopefully uh, this convinces you that there is some problem to be solved here, right? That this problem doing inference on the best performing treatment in an experiment uh, generates inference issues that we might want to address. Once we say we want to address these issues, though, we have to take a stand on what we mean by fixing them, sort of what precisely is it we're trying to achieve. And we're going to think about two potential goals here. The first being what we'll call conditional inference. So for conditional inference, we'll want procedures that are valid conditional on theta half. 
That is to say, we want validity conditional on the recommendation made, conditional on the treatment that we're sort of picking out. For confidence sets, for instance, this would say that the conditional probability that we cover the true effectiveness of the recommended treatment, conditional on the particular recommendation made, should be at least one minus alpha, right? At least 95%, say. While for estimators, we could think about conditional median unbiasedness. So the conditional overestimation probability, again, conditional on the recommendation made, should be a half. As an alternative, though, we can also think about unconditional inference where we require validity only on average across different values of theta hat, different recommendations that we might make rather than conditional on a given recommendation. For confidence sets, for instance, this would say that the unconditional coverage probability should be at least 95%, right? While for estimators, this would say the unconditional overestimation probability should be a half. Now, unconditional inference is less demanding than conditional inference, right? The law of iterative expectations tells us that any valid conditional procedure is necessarily also valid unconditionally. That means though, that the class of unconditional procedures is larger. So if all we actually care about is unconditional performance, we might be able to do better in terms of uh, statistical performance by focusing on unconditional procedures. Now I've introduced these two potential goals, conditional versus unconditional validity, which raises the, right, the question of sort of which of these is the right one to impose. And at least at this point, um, to us, this really seems to be a question about sort of what your preferences are and what you're trying to achieve. And I find it helpful to think this through in the context of an example. So for this example, right, suppose we're just thinking about two treatments where theta one is some new treatment that we're trying out, where while theta two is a control, where the control corresponds to sort of the baseline or status quo. If I impose only unconditional validity, and the probability that I recommend the new treatment is small, then it could be that the coverage probability conditional on recommending the new treatment is much, much less than one minus alpha, right? So this would say that, you know, in those instances where I recommend a deviation from the status quo, my confidence sets are systematically over-optimistic with the consequence that if I were to follow this recommendation and actually implement the new treatment, I would find that the results are systematically disappointing. And the unconditional versus unconditional validity question is really about whether this situation bothers us. But if it bothers me that whenever I recommend a deviation from the status quo, the results are disappointing, then that precisely says I want coverage conditional on the recommendation, right? I want to ensure coverage conditional on recommending a deviation from the status quo, so I need conditional validity. On the other hand, right, the premise here was that the probability that I recommend the new treatment is small. Right? And so I could also say, well, most of the time I'm not recommending the new thing. And so the fact that something bad happens conditional on that low probability event doesn't bother me all that much. And in that case, it's enough for me to impose unconditional validity. So having set up these two goals, conditional versus unconditional validity, what can we do to achieve each? So first, let's think about conditional inference. So for conditional inference, we're trying to do inference on mu theta hat, the true effectiveness of the recommended treatment, conditional on that recommendation. And we'll use the fact that the distribution of x, the distribution of basically my vector of effectiveness estimates for all the treatments, is going to follow a multivariate truncated normal distribution conditional on the recommendation made. Truncated normal distributions belong to the exponential family. So we can use exponential family results to get optimal median unbiased estimators and equal tailed confidence sets, where these confidence sets are equal tailed in the sense that they're equally likely to over and undershoot the true effectiveness. What about unconditional inference? So for unconditional inference, as I said, right, conditional validity implies unconditional validity. So one thing we could do is to just keep using the conditional confidence set. Alternatively, uh, we could use what, a procedure that's actually available in the previous literature, uh, which we're going to call the projection confidence set. This takes the standard estimate, adds and subtracts a critical value, but instead of using 1.96 here, I'm going to use a different critical value, in particular one equal to the one minus alpha quantile of the max of the absolute value of two norms. Right? The particular form of this confidence set comes from the fact that what I'm really doing in the background here is I'm forming a rectangular joint confidence set for the effectiveness of all the treatments simultaneously. And then I'm taking the projection of that rectangle on the dimension of interest to construct my confidence set from mu theta hat. 
right? Hence the name projection. As it turns out, neither of these confidence sets ends up being fully satisfactory. In particular, the conditional confidence set performs well when one treatment is much more effective than the other, while it performs poorly when the two treatments are roughly similar effectiveness. And I'll show you that in a minute. By contrast, the projection set performs well when the two treatments are of similar effectiveness, but ends up being unnecessarily wide when there's a clear best treatment. Now, if we require conditional coverage, right, I already said that the conditional procedures we develop are optimal. So if you're satisfied with the sense in which they're op they're, they are optimal as a theorem, there's no scope for improvement. By contrast, if we only care about unconditional coverage, right, we can potentially do better. And to do that, we propose a hybrid confidence set and a corresponding estimator, where this hybrid approach uh, is based on combining conditioning and, a project and projection in a way that I'll, that's detailed in the paper, and that we find allows substantial unconditional performance improvements. To wrap up, let me just show you sort of in some pictures what this looks like going back to the toy example and focusing on the case with 50 policies to avoid showing too many, uh, too many of these plots. So here I'm starting with the coverage probability of these different confidence sets. As we saw before, the conventional confidence set dramatically undercovers when the treatments are of similar effectiveness. By contrast, the solid line here is projection. And we see that its coverage starts out right about 95% when the treatments are of similar effectiveness, but then it's dramatically overcovering with coverage very close to 100% when one treatment is much better than the others. By contrast, the conditional and projection confidence sets have coverage uh, close to 95% up to simulation error across all the parameter values considered here. Of course, in addition to coverage, we also do care about length. So here I'm showing you the median length of these different confidence sets. The conventional confidence set is the shortest, but we saw that it's undercovering down here, so it's too short. The length of the projection confidence set doesn't depend on the gap between the best and second best treatments, and it's doing well down here, but it's much too long up here. The conditional confidence set, interestingly, starts out even longer than the projection confidence set when the treatments are of similar effectiveness. But as I make one treatment more effective than the others, its length comes down and actually converges all the way down to the length of the conventional confidence set. So this is what I was saying about how conditional does poorly when the treatments are of similar effectiveness, but does well when there's a clear winner. Interestingly, the hybrid approach that we propose for this simulation design beats projection everywhere while also converging almost all the way down to the uh, conventional confidence set when there's a clear winner. So in that sense, if we're satisfied with unconditional coverage, it gets almost the best of both worlds here. So to wrap up, uh, this project is motivated by the fact that inference on the best performing treatment invalidates conventional input procedures. To address this, we develop optimal inference procedures that are valid conditional on the treatment selected. Or for settings where we're satisfied with unconditional validity, we propose hybrid inference procedures with better performance. Of course, uh, in the paper, we go beyond the toy example I've talked about here and extend our results to more general settings, general correlation structures, asymptotic results, and so on. Uh, we show how similar ideas can be used to dominate sample splitting, which is another approach to deal with winner's curse bias. And we illustrate all this with applications. So thanks very much. Thanks, Isaiah. That was that was really interesting. So in, in just a second, we'll we'll take some more general questions for, for either uh, John or or Isaiah. Um, so uh, please uh, post things in the QA or or raise your hand if you want to ask uh, questions. Um, first, I, I've got a question um, uh, for for you, Isaiah. I mean, and this is a little bit about what I, I'm seeing is a more common thing in the practice of digital experimentation is people using um, some sort of shrinkage estimation um, based on the expectation that, okay, there's, yeah, there's variance in our estimates of the quality of each treatment. And that could be harmful both because of winner's curse kinds of issues, but also just in general, it might make us not really understand the scale of the variation. And so my sense would be that some of these shrinkage estimators, whether it's, you know, Bayes, empirical Bayes, something else, um, could help mitigate some of this problem, though my, the, my sense would be that they're not going to sort of directly solve it and guarantee coverage. And so how do you see this fitting in with that? And is this, can this approach be used potentially in combination with something like, um, you know, uh, shrinkage from a random effects model or something? 
Absolutely, yeah. So, so that's um, that's something we talk a little bit about in the paper. But yeah, it's fantastic, fantastic question, and totally agree. I mean, as picking based on some version of a shrunk estimate makes a ton of sense for exactly the exactly the reasons you outlined. Now, let's take the empirical Bayes approach. Um, so, say I'm doing empirical Bayes or right, random effects model or empirical Bayes. If I believe the parametric assumption underlying that model, right? So sort of if I'm, if I'm doing basically Bayesian shrinkage and picking based on my posterior mean and my prior really is my prior, then that resolves the winner's curse issue, right? In the sense that sort of under my prior, I expect that this is sort of totally solving the issue. The, the difficulty there comes with sort of, am I 100% believing my prior, right? So in some sense, the immunity of Bayesian procedures to winner's curse type issues comes from, like relies on sort of, I'm calculating the winner's curse bias under the same prior that I'm using to do the shrinkage, right? Now, something that you can do though, is actually you can use our results to basically robustify um, empirical Bayes type shrinkage, right? So sort of, I do my selection based on an empirical Bayes estimate, but then I want to ensure that I'm sort of immune to winner's curse bias, no matter the underlying distribution or effect sizes. And you can achieve that using the same sorts of machinery that we use where, you know, if you're, if you're doing sort of empirical Bayes shrinkage with a normal prior, everything is linear. It actually plugs just directly into our setting. If you're doing a more complicated nonlinear shrinkage procedure, you sort of have to do some additional algebra in the background to figure out the right stuff to condition on, but basically all the ideas still apply. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, I think I know it, that we we have some talks in the parallel sessions that will involve, you know, empirical Bayes shrinkage, that kind of thing. So that seems to be, be, uh, be becoming uh, more common. So yeah. um, cool. So um, I, I think if there's any questions for uh, either Isaiah, Isaiah or John, uh, please, uh, you know, uh, raise your hand or uh, post them in, in the Q&A and we'll get to them. I, I certainly have plenty more to ask both of you. And so I think on the, on the connection between these two areas. Um, to me, it seems like one of the, the big questions is, is what is the distribution of true effect sizes that we think exists in different settings, right? So that was core to what you were just showing us, Isaiah, is like how much better is the best thing we're trying, right? And, and John, in what you were talking about, it seems like one of the fundamental questions is in some cases, is there a silver bullet? Is there some treatment out there that's just so amazing and we just have to find it? And so it's a matter of screening many possible ideas for this one big one, or is it more a matter of there's a lot of things that kind of work a little bit? Um, and what intuitions might we have about that, whether from um, theory or your own just empirical experiences? Um, Maybe, maybe uh, John. Yeah, Isaiah, do you want to go first oh. or do you want me to go? Okay, I'll go. <laughs> so it's, I can go, can go Isaiah. <laughs> okay, so, so Dean, that's a good question. So I think a useful place to start is to say, um, John, can you give us an example of an idea that would cross all of your five hurdles or, or satisfy the five vital signs and then talk a little bit about um, heterogeneity and populations or situations and how that might map into different treatment effect sizes. So the best example that I can think of is, um, is polio vaccinations. So you had um, Salk tested it out right away in his own kids. A lot of scientists did that. I, did, I do the same thing. I have eight kids and I've, uh, I test out my behavioral theories first on my kids. Um, and then you want to make sure it, uh, it can replicate and you have a, a true effect and Salk did that. Um, so he finds that it works for all kids. There, there's not really a representative population problem. So he solved bins one and two. Now in his case, he has a really hard time with the situation because he needs to now worry about getting the medicine in, in people's arms. But the way that that was solved the delivery mechanism was solved is they did it through the healthcare system. And in that way, when your child goes for the six or 12 or year and a half month checkup, you naturally get your vaccination schedule taken care of. So he took care of that aspect of it. That's the aspect that we haven't been able to figure out yet with COVID and with a lot of other medications is that adherence. 
or, or getting it to people. That was part of the situation that when you test a medicine in the Petri dish, that aspect adherence is pretty much out, out on the other side. So that was taken care of in salts. You have great spillover and GE effects because once you get the vaccination, you don't get polio to anyone else. So you get at scale, you get even bigger benefits. Um, and then the cost side was obviously taken care of because it's uh, it's economies of uh, of scale, obviously, because most of the expense for most drugs are are upfront fixed cost. Okay, so so that's a, like a good example, instructive example that checked off all the boxes, and then it could scale very well across populations and situations. Now, in our own research, what you find, let's go now to complex behavioral interventions. Like that's what we talk about a lot. Um, in most situations, we oftentimes talk about generalizing across situations of people. We, you know, we stratify on race, gender, age, wealth, census, income block, et cetera. That's good stuff. It's great. Um, but we oftentimes generalize across situations without ever blocking on them. You know, things like a teacher quality or, or the wealth of situations that might matter in our own work. We find that, a crime, you know, whether somebody's watching you or not in a social preference game is really, really important. That's a different kind of situation. The choice setting, the choice architecture, these are all important. And we tend to generalize across those without even really thinking about it, but we generalize across people only with great caution. I think that's because we don't really know what features to look for in the situation and that might matter. So then we throw our hands up and say, well, we're not gonna really analyze anything. I think that's the wrong way. I think it, put on your econ hat. So Levitt and I wrote down a theory in 2007 in the Journal of Economic Perspectives paper that said, here's how we think about generosity from one individual to another. These are some situational features that might matter. The level of scrutiny, the level of stakes, the norms around the situation. So we put a stake in the ground that said, those are three features of the situation that might matter. Now let's test those. It turns out that they all matter. So what I think we need to do is we have a theory. We then test that theory in the original design. Those are called moderators. And we can causally uh, change those as well, do some causal moderation. And then from there, it just picks itself up because then you start to understand what are the key elements of choice situations that affect choice itself. And when we start to block on those and understand those, then we have a lot better feeling about what's gonna happen at scale. So I'll stop there and throw it over to, to Isaiah. And I guess one, one kind of comment on that is that, you know, when I think about something like the polio vaccine, that's just this huge effect size. Right. So among all the all the things that wouldn't work. Right. They they're sort of all not working together. And then thinking about it in Isaiah's scenario, that's a case where that has a very different mean than everything else. And, and mm -hmm. then, you know, when you mention these sort of choice situations, I might think that a lot of that is much more kind of continuous, that it's not a matter of really ridiculously kind of fat tails of some choice situations matter a lot. Or, or not, in which case we could easily screen for them with many small experiments, with a high dimensional experiment right. changing many things at once, right. we could easily figure out what matters. Instead, everything kind of always matters a little bit. Is that? Yeah, yes or no, I mean, let's look at the case of anemia and double fortified salt, that, that's in the population. So that works for young women. India rolls it out and it doesn't work for the overall population, but it only works for a segment of it. Some like think about tipping at, at Uber. We rolled out uh, tipping. If you want people to tip a lot, it needs to be face to face. If you don't want them to tip much, then then do it impersonally. Um, so so I think the situations I, I model them as continuous. Um, a lot of times we use as examples discrete ones that cause big changes, but I think about these in, in many elements, just like money is a continuous variable that affects choice, but we just don't understand how much it affects it because we haven't explored the key features of situations just yet, but I see that's where it's going. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah well, I, I guess building on that, I mean, I guess, yeah, to me, 
something something that feels like a very like a very interesting thing I would like to understand better in exactly this this sort of case is like what are the what are the situations in which the portfolios of interventions we are thinking about trying have like these very dispersed effect size distribution where versus where are they pretty concentrated and what sorts of what aspects of the situations what aspects of the treatments we're thinking about are sort of generating these different these different effect size distributions so even just empirical research on the distribution of effect sizes across different sorts of situations and what sorts of things are predictive feels like a super interesting question to me, in part because exactly like you say, Dean, right, it's super important for like, do I want to run some small, do I want to run a small number of big experiments, a ton of very small experiments? Like it's, it seems like a super interesting question. Yeah, and I think I think it seems like it varies a lot across different situations. I know some researchers at, at Microsoft, um, Eduardo Avazedo and, and colleagues, and in some of my own research, we found these very heavy tail distributions of effect sizes, um, uh, which which kind of makes sense in a lot of these settings. Some things seem to work, some things don't seem to work, um, uh, and and maybe that has some implications there. I mean, actually, kind of connecting these two issues of of sort of contextual factors and also effect sizes and searching for winners. I thought Isaiah about how some of your uh, work here could apply or, or maybe maybe not to contextual policy learning or learning a treatment rule where mm -hmm. we're deciding not just do we go with, you know, uh, theta one or theta two, but we're deciding for whom do we go with theta one or theta two based on some covariates, right? I, mm -hmm. I think that creates potentially a much higher dimensional space of actions we can take um, and then uh, can, can make this, uh, this winner's curse problem uh, potentially a lot worse. There's also a lot more complex correlation structure there. And, and that just seems like one of the things that practically, if, if these situations do matter or people's characteristics do matter, uh, we may end up wanting those kinds of composite treatments or sort of uh, you know, treatment assignment policies. Absolutely. And I mean, one, right, uh, so this is, this is slightly different, but sort of illustrates how, how quickly the dimension of the treatments you're considering can get out of hand, right? One, one example that we consider in the paper is this experiment that's basically targeting, um, sort of targeting um, vouch sort of assistance to help low-income families move to higher opportunity census tracts in the Seattle metro area. Right, and basically the, the, the treatment there, right, is basically a set of targeted census tracts, right, where the, the number that they're targeting is roughly a third of the census tracts in the Seattle metro area, right? But then if you ask sort of what's, the, what's then the implicit number of treatments lurking in the background there, right, it's the number of ways you could pick a third of census tracts out of the number in the Seattle metro area, which ends up being more, to, more than 10 to the 80, <laughs> right? So it's sort of, you know, selection problems, sort of tar covariate specific targeting problems, just very, very quickly explode the effective number of treatments. And so if we don't do something to deal with this winner's curse type issue, right, which could be, you know, if we, if we have a prior we're comfortable with, or we think we can estimate the distribution of effect sizes very well, that could be something empirical Bayes style. If we want sort of a lot of robustness with respect to that, that could be using our style of corrections, other things of that nature. Sort of, if we don't do something to address with it, address these issues, we end up with a huge amount of a winner's curse bias. Yeah, and my sense is kind of the status quo for people who are trying to learn these treatment rules, these policies, is to do some kind of regularized search over a more, you know, constrained policy space, and then to do sample splitting to evaluate mm -hmm. uh, then what you've learned on some new sample, either that's just a split sample from the experiment or an actual replication. And one of the things you mentioned was the idea that the approach that you were offering here could beat sample splitting, given that that's maybe a thing that people have in their mind as a solution. Uh, can you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. And so this is this the, the sort of fact that you can beat sample splitting is sort of building on um, building on some some results in the statistics literature, for example, uh, Fithian, and Son and Taylor. And so the the idea there is essentially that, right, when I do sample splitting, what I'm doing is I'm essentially can sort of, I'm using part of the data to pick my treatment, part of the data to in, do inference on how good my treatment is. But basically when I come to the inference stage, I'm just throwing out the first part of the data entirely, right? Which you could think of as I'm basically conditioning on the whole first part of the data. 
But if I'm sort of, which if I, if I have no idea how I did the selection, right, I sort of looked at the data, I poked at it, I plotted this, I plotted this, I plotted this, I thought hard about it, and I ended up deciding to do this thing, then I have a really hard time formally modeling that procedure I used to come to a treatment. And so maybe I should just condition on the whole data set and call it a day. But on the other hand, right, if I applied some shrinkage procedure to the first half of the data, picked out the thing that did best, then I actually have a lot of structure on how I did the selection. And then maybe what I can do is not, rather than conditioning on the whole first part of the data, I can just condition on the thing that I picked, right? In the same manner as like our conditional inference procedures condition on theta hat, right? Effectively, you condition on the theta hat generated by what you did in the first half of the data. And it turns out that basically when you do that, there's residual information left in the first half of the data about the effectiveness of that treatment. And if you combine that residual information in the first half of the data with the full information in the second half of the data, you can prove that you get shorter confidence intervals, you do better than if you just use the second half of the data. Right? Where of course the how much better you do is gonna depend on first, how big was the first part of the data, right? Did you use 80% of the data for selection and 20% for inference or 20% for selection and 80% for inference? And also will of course depend on, you know, depending on the selection procedure you used, how much information does that leave to do inference? But that's basically the idea of um, sort of beating sample splitting is exploiting that additional information in the part of the data used for selection. Cool, at least for me, that was really helpful in uh, intuition uh, building uh, there. Um, what, so one thing I wanted to ask about that connects a little bit more with, uh, with what you touched on, John, but I, I know Isaiah, you may have some thoughts on this as well, is, is dealing with, with spillovers or violations of the stable unit treatment value assumption. Um, the idea that uh, one person's treatment is not affecting somebody else's outcome. And so um, in, in some ways this could be a problem, right? This could be a, a, a reason that uh, it's hard to scale something up, um, but it could also just be sort of attenuation and evaluation. And so um, how, how should we think about like uh, dealing with spillovers, do, do we really have to deal with them or, or should we just kind of expect that when we think they're present, maybe our results are, are a bit attenuated um, in, in certain cases or in other cases, it could be in the totally in opposite direction. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So, so this came, uh, so Dean, thanks for the question. This came up in the, in the chat box too, a, a little bit and um, so, so the way I answered it there is a lot depends on kind of what you're after. If, um, if you're after a straight out causal inference, um, it's always nice to have your exclusion restrictions met. Um, <laughs> you, you, uh, you don't want to throw out the very first one uh, and have a super violation. For, for my interest in this book, um, I try to go beyond testing parts of the education production function. So let's put the causal inference on the side and say, look, there is a SUPA violation in our data. And I think a SUPA violation um, will occur in a lot of our, everyone on the call probably has several examples where it happens in their data too. Okay. So <clears throat> for me, it's characterizing what that violation looks like. In our case, it was treatment people spilled over to control people. Okay, so what that meant was my frontline estimate of check was too conservative. Why? Because the control people were too good. Um, when you look at control kids who weren't contaminated by treatment kids, we got a really large treatment effect. When they are contaminated, it's really tiny and insignificant in many cases. So now for scaling, my argument, it's important to understand any types of spillovers. In that example, it, when I scale the program, I'm going to have high voltage at scale. Why? Because those spillovers, first of all, the control group will be clean. So I'm going to have the, the right control group at scale. Plus, there were spillovers from treatment to treatment kits. So those are also important to understand to have an sort of a good metric or a good profile of when we scale this thing up, all I'm asking for is these are features of many programs. Spillovers are important features. Think about Facebook, your, uh, your host. If, you, if only five people have Facebook in the world and you do an experiment saying, what's your willingness to pay for Facebook? Nearly everyone will say zero. 
But because of network externalities of all of your friends and all of their friends and everyone else has Facebook, and you say, what's the value of Facebook to you? Your willingness to pay is quite high. Why? Because there are a lot of spillovers and consumption in goods like Facebook. So the value of Facebook is very different depending on the scale of it. This happens with many of our goods. And my only point in that vital sign is we need, a lot of times we just ignore them because we have to ignore them to make proper causal inference for our internally valid estimates. But what I'm saying is those are features that we should be measuring and exploring and celebrating because many of those features will lead to high voltage uh, when we scale something and in cases where it goes the other way. Um, we need and I think the example you gave from John Horton's work with, with Uber was like that, where yeah, that's right. That's that, a spillover. The, the effect the completely thing goes away. And, but yeah, I, I like this way of also framing it that especially if the size of the spillovers are different across different treatments, then you now have really poor screening on what the eventual effect size will be from your small scale intervention, because some of them are going to only get better. Some of them right. are going to get worse. Yeah. And you're not sure which is which. So um, so it, it gets to this idea of just how misleading sometimes that initial screening step um, can be. That's right. Yeah. Um, so one thing I wanted to ask about was kind of thinking about, you know, in, in a firm or an organization, the expertise required to do some of this. So I think one of the reasons, uh, you know, this is sort of a, a lay theory of like um, why A-B testing is so popular is that as we know, it's more complicated than sometimes it may seem, but it's relatively possible to encapsulate a lot of it in some standardized tooling that allows routinization of experimentation. Um, now, some, uh, some other things are a little bit harder to routinize. Um, and so that could be like analyzing spillovers. All of a sudden it's like, oh, now we want some smart person to write down a model of the situation and think about what the spillovers that, that are that might matter. Um, and so just what do you think of as, as some of the expertise that firms might need or, or how possible is it to routinize some of this, this kind of voltage check and, and analysis. And I think about this even in, in the case of your work as, as well, Isaiah, of uh, to what degree is this something that we can really bake in to the kinds of uh, tooling that we give people? Because um, that's part of what has, I think, made A-B testing so successful in an industry setting is how routine it can become. John? You want me to go first or Isaiah, do you want to go first, my friend? Uh, I mean, my, mine is relatively short, which is that I, I think a, a nice thing about the winner's curse correction is sort of subject to being able to describe what it is that you're actually using to pick the winner and what set of things you're comparing to. You can actually make it quite routine. I mean, we have a web app where you just plug in estimates in a covariance matrix and spit out corrected estimates. So in that sense, sort of subject to sort of having a well-defined setting for the winner's curse problem, that one can be made routine. I think John sounds harder. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me, uh, well, that's a challenge. That's a challenge. Okay, so, so different levels. So, so different levels. Let's, uh, let's first of all think about um, new innovations that we can put inside of a firm that can lead to better outcomes and better choices. So, so think about, um, I, I've worked recently on, on MHT, multiple hypothesis testing, and uh, with Azeem Sheikh and, uh, and others. And now that's not hard to insert into Lyft's um, experimental program. They, they do AB. I always push to do deeper than AB because it's important to understand mechanisms, but that's a different conference. Um, and make sure that you correct for MHT. That's patch. Okay, the this, this stuff that Isaiah is talking about is important. And I believe that that is insertable exactly as Isaiah is talking about. That all, it, it all really is like an N of one problem. Does your org, org have a person who's willing to write a memo and step up to ELT and step up to the experimentation team and say, we're gonna do this. That was, that's me at left. We're gonna do this MHT because I think it's an important problem. And then I can point them all to my study. And then, okay, John's an expert in that, blah, blah, blah. Now, 
when we're talking about some of the other features that I mentioned, the, the first is not hard. Like at Lyft, it's not hard to have a PSP, you know, regardless of your prior, to have a PSP of 0.95, that's like three or four replications. We can have that done in two nights. Okay. Um, representativeness of the population, same thing. Um, it's not that hard in, in, a, in a larger organization to make sure we understand quickly um, for which types of people, as long as we have a, a good covariate factor, uh, for which people does is this working for? The third one, the same thing. When, when I think about this problem, it's a multi-site trial problem, and I can pick off different people in different situations that my theory thinks are important. Think about for what I brought up before tipping. Okay. What do the experts tell us? The experts tell us that the architecture matters. What's one piece of the architecture? The ask string, five, 10, or 15%, or should we do zero, one, or $3? Okay, so that's the behavioral scientists kind of tell you, what are some important features around tipping? Okay, let's test those right away. Now, now we can do an in, in-ride in tip app versus a post-ride, and that gets at the scrutiny element that I mentioned. You can do that all within a week or so. You just need to know which parts of the situation will matter for you. Now, the cost side's not that hard. It's just from the firm side, we, we have a good feeling of that. Spillovers in, um, <clears throat> in GE is a little bit more involved. In, in and, of, and that's part of what I was really thinking about. Because more, that's where often it seems like somebody's it, it got takes to write a little bit more model. imagination do a custom analysis, run a differently designed experiment, et cetera, so. Fair enough, the, let's put it this way. The tools are there to set up the steps for what you should do. The fact that we don't have a ton of paper, the Crepon et al is a good paper. We have a paper coming out from Lyft where 5% of drivers, there was an error in their earnings all the way up to 95% across markets. And then we can show how how that infiltrates the whole market system. John's paper is a good example. I think as we have more and more of these examples, people tend to be emulators. And if they see what, what's worked and what's been an issue in other settings, a lot of times that does in some small piece spill over to, to having some truth in other elements. And I think as we build that knowledge base, that will become as easy as the other ones. But to be fair, I think we're some time away from that too. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, anyway, I think this is a great, great session. I, I, I know there's one more question in the Q&A that I think uh, Isaiah is uh, answering, but uh, we're over time. So we're going to uh, go now to the, to the break.